Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thanks to everyone for being here. I know I've given a lot of <laughs> webinars on pollinators in Santa Fe, but this one should be a little different and exciting. I'm going to talk a little bit more about specific bees you can find in Santa Fe and highlight some of the really great properties that have really incredible pollinator habitat in and around the city. So um, first, I'm going to give a short overview of Xerces and the importance of pollinators. Then I'll talk a little bit about who are the pollinators and what they need in their habitat. And then I'll share some really great places where you can observe pollinators in Santa Fe and find some inspiration for creating pollinator gardens in your own yard. So to begin, let me make sure I can advance slides. There we go. Okay. So um, to begin, I just want to quickly acknowledge um, a few different people that make our work possible at Xerces. We are a member-supported nonprofit, so our Xerces Society members are really crucial to the work we, that we do, and particularly in the Southwest, the Carol Petrie Foundation really helps us out in funding our work here in the Southwest and many other organizations and donors support us. So I just wanna say thank you to those folks that um, help make our work possible. And so if you aren't familiar with the Xerces Society, we are an international organization dedicated to the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. We have staff in regional offices throughout the United States and New Mexico was just added to that list last year. A lot of our work is dedicated to insects like bees and butterflies, fireflies and dragonflies, but also other invertebrates. So animals without a spine or a backbone, but so things like snails and freshwater mussels. So invertebrates are really important to conservation because they make up 94% of species on our planet and they play really crucial roles for the function of our planet. So this includes things like pollination, which is why we're all interested in pollinators, but also things like seed dispersal, decomposition, and they make up the base of the food web as food sources for many other wildlife species. And Xerces Society you might wonder where, where does this name Xerces come from? Our name Xerces honors this now extinct uh, blue butterfly on the left here. This is a Xerces blue butterfly. And it was a butterfly species found only in sand dune habitats of the San Francisco Bay area. And the destruction of those dunes led to the extinction of this species. So in naming ourselves Xerces, we're honoring this butterfly species that was lost due to human impacts. And we are dedicating ourselves to preventing that from happening and conserving other invertebrates. And we work to protect invertebrates in a variety of settings with programs dedicated to pollinators and agricultural biodiversity endangered and aquatic species, pesticide program, and urban conservation. And we use restoration, research, education, outreach, and advocacy to further our mission. And while we work with a number of other invertebrates and endangered species, our pollinator program is really large and robust. And we work to protect pollinators in a variety of settings from urban spaces to agricultural landscapes to undeveloped natural areas. So why do we work so diligently to protect pollinators in particular? So pollinators are a really important uh, ecological keystone wildlife species. So more than 85% of our flowering plants require an animal. Most of those are insects to move pollen. And these pollen moving creatures are called pollinators. And that includes some vertebrates like hummingbirds and bats, but the vast majority are insects like bees and butterflies. And since pollinators are essential for so many different plant species to reproduce, they help maintain populations of wild plants and our natural ecosystems. 
and help produce the seeds and the fruits those plants make that become major food sources for wildlife. And the pollinators, those insects, those small insects themselves are really critical to the diets of many other wildlife species, including birds, mammals, fish, and even other insects. And another really great thing about working to conserve pollinators is that if we create habitat for pollinators by growing native plants and protecting areas from development, we're also helping create uh, habitat for other wildlife species. So if we conserve pollinators, we can also typically conserve other wildlife. Pollinators are also very critical to us humans. Um, they are critical to the production of a lot of the food we eat. And they are essential to 35% of global crop production, helping farmers produce foods and feeding the global population. And just to give you an idea of how much pollinators contribute to the food we eat, we partnered with Whole Foods to remove all de-pollinated crops from their produce department. So this is what a normal Whole Foods produce department looks like, but without those de-pollinated uh, produce items, this is what we're left with. Uh, the Whole Foods staff took out 52% of the produce items normally sold at the store. So this includes things like apples, avocados, eggplant, and squash. And this is just the produce section. So pollinators help produce a lot of our really nutritious produce, vegetable, uh, fruit selections in our grocery stores, but also things like uh, coffee and chocolate are essential to um, are essential for pollination by insects. And so we rely on pollinators for a balanced, nutritious diet and for some of our favorite vices like coffee and chocolate. Oh, oops, sorry. Okay, so um, while a lot of our pollinators include many insects, there are a few vertebrates like bats and birds that pollinate flowers. But most movement of pollen between flowers is carried out by insects. And this includes some insects that you probably already know of as pollinators like butterflies, bees, and moths. But um, a few might not come to mind so quickly like wasps, beetles, and flies are also really important insect pollinators. And all of these different insects will visit flowers um, to feed on nectar and pollen as adults, but specifically female bees also visit flowers to collect pollen to feed their offspring. And because of this, that makes bees the most efficient and important pollinator. So because they're collecting lots of pollen on their bodies, going to another flower to collect more pollen, that means they're really, really efficient at moving pollen between flowers. And why they're collecting that pollen is um, so that they can collect lots to feed their babies um, for, for the next generation of those bees. Um, another thing that makes bees really great at pollinating flowers is that they exhibit flower constancy, which means that they prefer to visit the same kind of flower over and over again. So when those bees are visiting that same flower, they're pollinating the same species of flower. Instead of moving pollen to different species that won't reproduce, these bees that like to visit the same kind of flower over and over again, they help really improve seed set and uh, plant reproduction. They also forage in an area around a nest. So because those female bees are taking that pollen and putting it um, in their nests for their babies to eat. They're really great at um, helping improve plant reproduction in like one small area and improving that seed set in that area. And they're also really quite hairy, which helps them pick up more pollen. And so an important distinction to make is that um, when you think of a bee, you probably think of a honeybee and Yes, they are everywhere and they're super essential to our agricultural systems, but they are not your typical bee. They are an introduced species. They were um, introduced from Europe to the US 
And you're probably very familiar with um, what makes honeybees unique. So they're a social bee that has a caste system with queen workers and drones, and they are social and they live in these perennial hives. So these colonies of bees can live for multiple years. And honeybees are managed by people. Um, they're really essential to our agricultural systems. We have mobile hives that we move around to help um, improve crop pollination in our different agricultural settings. So they're really important to um, our agricultural production. But in the US, in the United States, um, North America, uh, honeybees are not our a native pollinator. So most of our flowering plants that are native to the US don't require honeybees in particular to um, reproduce. And while these honeybees are experiencing declines, you might have heard of colony collapse disorder. There's a lot of um, concern about honeybees, diseases, and other um, reasons for, for their declines. But they are really not a threat of extinction because they're so supported by human agricultural systems. They, they're, they're not really going anywhere. Um, and so since they're managed by humans, um, they, they're not a threat of extinction. Whereas we have many, many other pollinators and bee species that actually are native to North America and are experiencing really big declines. So when you hear save the bee, um, you might think of a honeybee and colony collapse disorder, but there are many, many other species of bees that are at threat of extinction and of population decline. And when we look at what bees exist in North America, in the US, there are 3,600 known species just in the US. This is a really cool graphic that kind of breaks down all the different families of bees. So you can see at the very top here of the pie chart is a tiny sliver of our social hive living bees. So our bumblebees also live in a small colony um, and honeybees is the one other uh, really social bee um, that lives in those colonies. And all of these other bees, most are solitary, about 70 or 90 percent are solitary. And about half of those bee species in the western U.S. at least are specialists. And what that means is that they only collect pollen for their babies. Their babies will only eat a certain kind of plant's pollen. So honeybees, bumblebees, um, those are generalist species. So they will collect pollen from just about any plant. They're not picky about what their babies will eat. But a lot of our bee species are actually specialist. And in the desert southwest in particular, uh, we have a really high diversity of bees. So um, in New Mexico alone, we have over a thousand bee species and bees just really diversify well in arid ecosystems. So in this um, map image, this is a, it, as the colors get darker, that's the more number of bee species you can have. So in the tropics, like a lot of different uh, wildlife and plant life where that's usually where you see the highest diversity. Bees are different and that they really diversify and have lots of species in our really arid system. So particularly in the um, desert southwest of North America, that's where you can see the most diversity of bees in um, arid parts of South America, that's where they have the highest bee diversity. And uh, just one cool uh, case study in Grand Staircase Escalante, where we have some really amazing Southwest bee researchers doing uh, bee surveys. Over 660 species were collected in just that one national monument. So just thinking about like if we did really intensive um, bee surveys across the Southwest, we could probably find a whole lot of bees in, in New Mexico. And something to consider for native bees, like I said, most are solitary. So what that means is that 
one female is uh, harvesting all of that pollen for her nest and she doesn't have any help from a male or any other female. So um, most bees are nesting uh, in the ground. So about 70% of our bee species are nesting in the ground and the other about 30% nest in stems or tunnels or cavities. So things like um, pithy hollow stems or little holes um, in logs and stumps. And then only about 1% of our native bees, the bumblebees, actually nest in kind of larger cavities. So like rodent burrows, they need a little bit more space, uh, usually underground, um, to have that bigger colony of bees, of bumblebees. And just to give you a quick um, rundown of what the life cycle of a solitary bee looks like, um, this is just a mining bee as an example. Um, lots of different bees will emerge at different times of year, so we'll just say this mining bee emerges in spring, and uh, she goes out and collects lots of pollen, and digs a nest, mates with a male, and lays her eggs in this nest, and then collects lots of pollen for those eggs. Those eggs will then hatch. The female, um, a lot of our bee species only live for about six to eight weeks. So in that short amount of time, she lays those eggs and collects all of that pollen for her babies, and then will lay an egg or have a pollen ball for each egg. Those um, eggs will eat the pollen, uh, pupate into pupa, and then the next year when they are ready to emerge, whatever time that species is uh, emerging the next year um, is when they will emerge and mate again. So they have these usually pretty short adult lifespans and then most of their lives they spend um, in the nest, um, feeding on that pollen, and then in a dormant stage as a pupa. And then just to give you an idea of what a bumblebee life cycle looks like, a hibernating queen bee will emerge in the spring. So they're active all year round. So that, so if you see like a really giant massive bumblebee flying around in early spring, that's a queen. Um, she will establish a nest and lay her eggs, and early in the summer, those eggs will hatch as the first brood of worker bees. Um, they will the colony will continue to grow into the summer, and then um, new queens will emerge in early fall. Males will leave the nest and mate with them. The queen from the founding colony will die, and then those mated queens will find a place to overwinter. So she's already mated and ready to lay eggs for the next year. So she will be dormant um, throughout the winter and start a new colony the next year. So this is um, kind of similar to honeybees, but on kind of a much smaller scale, there's only about a few hundred bumblebees in a colony. And they also are, um, uh, annual, whereas honeybee colonies are perennial. So just to give you a quick primer on looking at this diversity of bees and thinking about what you might see in Santa Fe, I just want to highlight some of the very common bees of Santa Fe that you'll see. And first, I just want to start with um, bumblebees, the bees that are active from spring to fall. So you'll see those big um, female queens flying about in uh, early spring. Then you'll see um, a, maybe a colony uh, foraging together on lots of different flowers. And you'll see them all the way from uh, spring until fall. And the genus is called Bombus. There's about 50 species in the US. And they're just these really easy to identify, giant, large, fuzzy, adorable bees that you can see um, throughout the year in Santa Fe. Uh, sorry, my uh, arrows don't want to work. There we go. Okay, so the next um, group of bees that you will often see 
from spring until fall in Santa Fe are these green sweat bees, iridescent green sweat bees. The genus is called Agapostamon. And there's about 30 different species in the US. And these are solitary bee. Most of our bees are solitary. This is um, one of those uh, bees that you'll see that um, the females do all of the, all of the work for creating a nest. And they're, they're probably pretty recognizable. They're those really tiny bees that are just a bright metallic green. And one really neat thing about them is it's very easy to tell males and females apart. So the top photo is of a male green sweat bee and his abdomen is black and yellow. So the males have a black and yellow abdomen and the female on the bottom here, it's not a great picture of her abdomen, but it's all green. So that is one cool thing that it's very easy to tell sweat bees apart um, by their abdomens and the colors of their abdomens. So in now just breaking up the other common bees by season, um, what you'll typically see in spring in Santa Fe are things like orchard bees, which are in the genus Osmia. These um, typically are kind of usually darker in color, but they're shiny, iridescent uh, colors usually. This picture on the top here is of a blue orchard bee. And orchard bee um, goes with their typically a pollinator of our fruit trees, our apples, our pears, our cherries. Um, they like to visit roses, all of those things in rosaceae, the fruit flowering trees that bloom in early spring, you'll see these bees all over them. And then the next bee that you'll see um, active in spring most of the time is the mining bee or andrina. And they're um, just kind of a small to medium bee, not super descript, um, just a pretty usually black and yellow abdomen, a little bit hairy, but not super hairy. All of these mining bees nest in the ground, hence mining. Um, and they're just one of those very early emerging bees you'll see in, in early spring. And um, like this one here, this bottom photo, this one's um, collecting pollen from a willow, another early blooming plant in, in Santa Fe. So I found this one on the Santa Fe River last year and these um, mining bees are, are pretty common. And this, by saying that there's spring, there's always some exception to the norm. So you'll see some andrina at different times of year, some osmia later in the summer. But for the most part, these are what you'll see in spring. And I had to give um, our summer bee, one of our most common summer bees, a, a little bit more attention. So our leaf cutter bees, are some of our most recognizable, very easy to spot and see. They're kind of a bigger bee. And there's a couple different uh, genuses or genera that you'll see very often. So the first, the top bee here, this little gif is of a mega Kylie. And it is, um, you can see as it goes across this yarrow, it's scooting her little abdomen along the bottom there. So that's what really makes leaf cutter bees stand out from other bees. All of their pollen collecting hairs are on the underside of their abdomen. And they're kind of bigger in size. And because they have that really distinct where their hair is located on their abdomen, very easy to recognize. Um, another really common one that you can see just everywhere right now is Lithergopsis, and this leaf cutter um, genus specializes on cacti. So um, the bottom gif here shows uh, her, she's just really, you can see her scraping that pollen down onto her abdomen and scooting around, getting lots of pollen stuck on those hairs. And um, why they're called leaf cutter bees is because they cut small circles out of leaves of plants for nesting material. So um, here's a little photo of what a leaf might look like when it has a leaf cutter bee using it for nesting material. So if you see this, don't be alarmed. It's just a leaf cutter bee taking some leaf material for her nest. It's not going to harm the plant. 
So um, just keep that in mind. Look at your roses. They typically like rose leaves. Um, you might be able to see some little holes cut out by these bees. Also in summer, some really common ones you'll see are digger bees and anthophora. So this one on top here um, in the hand of Olivia Carroll, she went and caught bees with me so I could have some pictures. Uh, this is a really common kind of um, medium to large bee that's usually pretty hairy. So you might mistake them for a bumblebee, but um, a lot of species have kind of a more gray, yellow color to their hairs, and they're smaller than bumblebees and pretty easy to distinguish. And one cool thing about the Anthophora, um, you can tell males and females apart by the males have very hairy front legs. So if you see a kind of bigger hairy bee with really hairy front legs, that's probably a male Anthophora. Um, and the other bee you'll see in the summer is uh, Carter bee, Anthidium. And they're really easy to distinguish because they like to hover in the air. So they'll hover and stay in one spot, move, hover. And they're kind of loud when they do that too. So they're pretty distinctive to, to notice. And they often have really dramatic black and yellow markings on their abdomen. So if you're seeing something that's really got some distinct markings and hovering in the air in the summer, you're probably looking at an anthidium. And then finally, for our active and late summer to fall is our longhorn bees, Melisodes. And these are very easy to distinguish because males and females, but particularly males, have extremely long antenna. And the, you can often find them hanging out on sunflowers. So they're um, about a medium-sized bee, kind of on the smaller side, but um, they just have ridiculously long antenna and are pretty very easy to distinguish from other bees. So those are some of the bees that you will see pretty much all the time um, or throughout the year in Santa Fe at different seasons and throughout the year. And I, I gave a lot of attention to bees and I just wanna <laughs> give um, a brief uh, introduction to butterflies and moth pollination and, and give them a little bit of spotlight too. So um, I talked about how important bees are to pollination because they're so efficient at it. Um, but one thing that's really neat about butterflies and moths is that because some of those species travel kind of longer distances, that can really help improve gene flow between plant populations. Because they're moving pollen from one population of plants to another that bees might not be able to reach, that's um, how they can really contribute to pollination services. Um, a lot of Butterflies and moths are specialists for different uh, flowering plant species. So they have become really important for specific things like uh, evening primrose are often pollinated by um, sphinx moths. And they can also play a role in nocturnal pollination. So most of our pollinators are daytime, but our moths can be really important for those um, flowers that open up at night that are specialized on moth pollination and they kind of break up that niche of when uh, pollinators are moving pollen during the day, they can come in and also move pollen at night. And just to quickly talk about what butterflies and moths need in their habitat, let's look at their life cycles. So an adult butterfly will lay her eggs on a host plant. And some butterflies and moths aren't picky. They are generalists. Those caterpillars will eat just about anything. Um, but some are, but most are actually pretty picky. So a great example is milkweed and a monarch. Most people are familiar with that. A monarch caterpillar will only eat milkweed plants. And those butterflies have to lay their eggs on milkweed for those caterpillars to survive. Um, those caterpillars will hatch and eat the host plant. If it's a specialist, they'll eat that specific plant, whatever they have available. And then um, those generalist caterpillars, they might move around to different plants. 
but um, those plants are very critical to feeding those caterpillars in that larval stage. Once the caterpillar has um, grown and becomes a pupa, which is a chrysalis for butterflies and a cocoon for moths, in case you didn't know the difference there, um, they can um, live in that chrysalis stage or cocoon stage for uh, months to weeks um, to even years, depending on what species you're talking about. Some can stay dormant in many years, and that's why you see really big booms of moths at different times of year when you have a really wet year versus dry year. So depending on um, the dormancy of the butterfly um, life stage, they can be dormant as a pupa. And then once those caterpillars are ready to emerge as adults, those adults will mate and visit flowers. That's when they're pollinating. So they're drinking nectar. Um, those moths, they're drinking nectar as adults. So those caterpillars eat plants and then the butterfly adult, adult moth stage is when they're actually pollinating. And um, so yeah, it's important to consider those two different life cycles of butterflies when um, you're selecting plants for a pollinator garden. So now that I've talked a little bit about pollinators and what they are and where, where they need to live, I want to highlight a few really cool spots throughout Santa Fe that I visited most usually recently um, and show you some of the cool things I've found. So first, I want to start with the Randall Davy Audubon Center. It is kind of on the east side of Santa Fe if you go all the way up Upper Canyon Road. Um, it's kind of at the dead end there, and they have a really wonderful pollinator garden. And it's open to the public from Monday through Saturday, and they have free hiking um, and garden trails. You can explore their garden, see their bird feeders, and um, the, also the Nature Conservancy property is right adjacent to it. And there's other trails right adjacent to it, the Dale Ball Trail. So it's a really great spot to um, go for a hike and then sit in a garden and watch the insect activity. Okay, and um, I visited the Randall Davy. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't change the Santa Fe Botanical Garden. This is what I saw at the Randall Davy Audubon Center. I saw on June 17th, I went there with Olivia Carroll and we caught bees. So uh, one thing we saw was a longhorn bee that was kind of early for most of those uh, genuses of bees. But um, we saw one visiting a Rocky Mountain Pinstemon. That was really exciting, probably some of the first longhorn bees of the year. Um, we also saw a digger bee, that Anthophora, which is kind of a bigger, hairier bee. You might mistake it for a bumblebee, but it is a um, really cool, uh, this one, you can see the front leg here is really hairy, so that is what uh, distinguishes it as a male. And this one was posing on a blanket flower for us, um, just looking, looking really happy there. Um, we also caught a green sweat bee, that agapostamon. Um, and it, you can see just from <laughs> how tiny it is from how large uh, Olivia's fingers look here. But, um, Obviously, very bright green iridescent, easy to distinguish. And finally, I did see, I did photograph a butterfly. Um, this is a green skipper nectaring on a type of sage. So this was just a small assortment of the things we saw that I got real decent pictures of. Um, and I should also mention that the Randall Davy Audubon Center uh, garden is managed by a group of Santa Fe Extension Master Gardeners, and they have done a really great job at creating excellent pollinator habitat, and uh, it's a good program for them to get involved in creating um, excellent pollinator habitat at the Randall Davy Center. Next, now we're on to Santa Fe Botanical Garden. Um, this uh, Garden is open to the public Thursday through Monday. They have a small admission fee, but um, 
they also have monthly free New Mexico resident days. So um, if you check out their website, you can see when they have community days or any New Mexico residents can uh, go in for free. And they have many native cultivated and ornamental flowering plants. So you have a, um, a few different types of gardens um, throughout, the, throughout the garden that have kind of focuses on like an orchard with roses, but also a ethnobotany garden, the Ojos y Manos garden that has lots of really important, um, culturally important plants and food plants, native plants. So a really, really diverse, interesting garden with lots going on. Um, this photo on the bottom here is a big queen bumblebee flying over some, I think some type of arugula or something, some native annual or uh, annual crop um, that they're growing in the Ojo Manos garden. And I visited the botanical garden yesterday and saw a few different things. Um, one of the first things I saw was this little dainty sulfur. It's a tiny little sulfur butterfly. Um, and this one is nectaring on a hairy false golden aster, a heterotheca velosa. And that's just, that butterfly is only um, less than an inch long. So a smaller, smaller butterfly, very cute. Um, another butterfly we saw is a variegated fritillary. This is a very common butterfly, very easy to recognize with its um, bars and spots on its wings. It's uh, nectaring on a common yarrow here. So that's one butterfly that you can see almost throughout anywhere in the US and definitely in Santa Fe. I also walked through their brand new uh, Pinion Juniper Woodland Trail, and that just opened very recently, and the cholla are blooming in there right now. So there were some cactus bees, that lithogopsis um, bee in those cactus flowers. And then finally, I, I'm thrown in a vertebrate. I did see some really feisty black tinned hummingbirds chasing each other um, in, throughout the garden. That was fun to see. <laughs> and Another spot I wanted to highlight was the um, Rail Yard Park Conservancy. So this is a, um, let's see, it's a, a city park, but it's also managed by a conservancy nonprofit. So it's a really um, active park with lots of events going on, lots of excellent volunteers working in, in the different gardens. And it is a city park, so it's open to the public every day. And it has um, lots of different native and a few cultivated um, plants, an orchard along Cerritos Road that attract a variety of pollinators. And there is a community garden with, um, and they also have graze days and a whole lot more. There's just a lot going on there in terms of um, educational programs, programs for kids, and uh, their Graze Days in particular is one of their events to hold to um, improve soil, but not mow by introducing uh, goats and sheep on the park to graze down all of the different grasses and weeds. So instead of mowing, they bring in a more natural way to help uh, keep the tidiness of the park in check. So a really, really cool park that um, also features this really great uh, bee house with a big educational sign and lots of cool um, cavity nesting material on the other side of the sign. So if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend checking it out. And oops, sorry. Um, I don't have any photos of the rail yard park. I haven't been there lately, but they have a lot of the same flowers that I'm showing from these other places. Um, another place I wanted to point out that's a little off the map is the water conservation office. Um, the city of Santa Fe has a water conservation office. It's down the road from the water department building and it's a little hard to find and it's not immediately visible on Google Maps. So where it is, it's located 
just north of San Mateo and just east of the railroad after the railroad crossing. So it's across from Midtown Bistro. If you, if you Google that, you'll find it. Um, but they have some really cool demonstration gardens available um, that you can visit anytime. And there's lots of native water wise plants, including cacti that attract lots of different pollinators. And so I just ran up there this morning to check it out. And their cactus garden has a few different species blooming and it was very active. So there are a ton of cactus bees out right now. And this ca cactus demonstration garden, everything that was blooming just had lots of these lithergopsis um, specialist leaf cutter bees um, collecting lots of pollen, having fights in the blossoms. It was, it's quite a sight to see. So if you have a chance to get over there, I highly recommend it. Um, so these, these bees, one cool thing about them is that um, you can tell they're these specialist leaf cutter bees because they're in cactus blossoms. But one neat thing that kind of sets them apart, um, dis one distinction you can make is the very end of their abdomen kind of has a rusty brown um, hairs on it. So that's one other cool identifying feature of these lithogopsis bees. And there are so many other places and I wanted to visit them all and just take pictures of bees every day, but I couldn't do that. <laughs> but I wanted to um, mention a few other places that are really great for thinking about demonstration uh, gardens, what um, you could use as inspiration for what you might wanna grow in your yard and where other places might have demonstration and educational events. So. In particular, the Master Gardener demonstration gardens at the fairgrounds. They have a couple different kinds. There's a cactus garden and a um, vegetable herb garden that has lots of um, examples of, of what to do um, when growing those different plants. And they do events there. So check out the Santa Fe Extension Master Gardener website to see um, their new events and look at their newsletter. There's the Nature Conservancy, TNC, Santa Fe Canyon Preserve. So this is um, not like a cultivated garden site, but it's a natural preserve right between um, Upper Canyon Road and the Randall Davy Center that follows the Santa Fe River and has lots of really great native natural landscape plants you can see there. There are also several city parks with pollinator plantings that includes the rail yard park, but also um, Rancho Seringo Community Garden um, and a few others throughout town. And also if you just um, walk along the rail trail and the Santa Fe River Trail, there's often those trails, those paved areas usually have lots of different flowering plants right along the side of them. So that um, that pavement ends up creating wetter spots along the side of the trail. So um, that water runs off the trail, creates a little bit wetter, nicer, easier place for plants to live. And you can see lots of things like upright prairie coneflower, Rocky Mountain pinstemon, um, lots of horsetail milkweed blooming right now. So if, even just taking a walk along um, some of the different trails in town, you can see a great amount of uh, pollinator and plant diversity. And speaking of trails, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Santa Fe Pollinator Trail, which is a pilot program um, for creating urban pollinator habitat connectivity. And we're starting in Santa Fe this year um, to create connected climate resilient pollinator habitat throughout urban Santa Fe. So, Thinking about um, all these incredible places that have really great pollinator habitat throughout our city, how can we help pollinators move between them and create pollinator habitat in our own backyards? So first, when we think about connecting habitat, let's talk about how we get there in the first place. So when we develop areas and lose habitat, 
we also create fragmentation of habitats where movement of wildlife is interrupted and uh, populations can become isolated. And a habitat patch is an area with natural resources, a space large enough for a particular species to successfully carry out part of its life cycle. So a pollinator habitat patch might look like lots of flowers and host plants for butterflies and an undisturbed area where insects can nest and overwinter and protection from pesticides. That's what an urban pollinator habitat patch might look like. So um, when you look at a landscape from above, you might be able to identify things like stepping stones where those pollinators can move from patch to patch through those little bits of resources and things like corridors. So something like the Santa Fe River could act as a corridor between um, the Randall Davy Audubon Center and the uh, Rail Yard Park. So thinking about how we can um, improve habitat in those areas and implement stepping stones by creating habitat in little patches where it doesn't currently exist. It's something that we're trying to do with this pollinator trail. And looking at an urban area, this is kind of downtown Santa Fe, the, you can see the river there um, kind of on the north end. Um, looking at an urban area, our significant habitat patches are limited to like things like parks and rivers, arroyos, the edges of the city and other open spaces. So we have a small patchwork of habitats existing in the city already, but if we can create those stepping stones and patches of pollinator habitat in these really densely developed areas, we can help connect those um, existing patches throughout the city. And if we look at Santa Fe, um, in, in an aerial view. There's uh, a couple different types of land covers here. We have like a natural land cover, forested and grassland. And then this gray land cover is our really densely developed urban, non-natural human infrastructure, basically. So um, a lot of that is not very useful to a lot of wildlife species. But within that urban area, we have little patches of parks and public open space that can act as stepping stones and places or uh, refuges for those pollinators to live. And we're going to look right at the rail yard park as an example and just pointing at it in that kind of really densely urban downtown area. This park has some really great flowering native plants in the heart of Santa Fe. And it's one of our really great existing pollinator patches in, in the city. And when we think about where we want to place um, habitat patches, we want to think about how far can a pollinator travel to that from wherever their nest is. So if we think about a pollinator nesting, a bee nesting in the rail yard park, and she can maybe travel up to half a mile to forage for pollen to feed her babies. This gives her um, a big area around the, around the park to forage for pollen. So if we can add more resources for pollinators in those really densely developed areas, we can support a lot more different species and bigger populations of these pollinators. And what we're really hoping to do with this pollinator trail is fill in these big gray developed spaces that don't have this natural land cover or these parks in any close distance to them. So if we would like to um, create those pollinator patches for pollinators throughout the city. Um, we would really like to focus um, building pollinator habitat in those gray spaces that are far from natural land cover and open spaces and create a little island of refuge for pollinators. So now that we have an idea of how connected habitat is created, let's talk about this other piece, the climate resilient habitat piece. 
So in creating climate resilient habitat, we want to promote really climate smart plant selection when we're doing urban landscaping. So making sure we're encouraging the use of drought tolerant species, heat tolerant species and local ecotypes. And um, specifically with local ecotypes, um, if you're sourcing your plants from, you know, a really wet place like Minnesota, there's, um, you, can, you can find a blanket flower that grows in wild populations and, you know, really wet, colder areas. But if you source those seeds from those areas, they're probably not going to do well here. So making sure we're sourcing things that are locally native and um, adapted to our really harsh environment in Santa Fe. That's something we can um, choose to do when creating this landscape. And I just wanted to highlight Desert Willow. Desert Willow is a great example of that. It's um, really heat and drought tolerant and a really great pollinator plant that will probably stand the test of time as climate change encroaches into the Southwest more and more. And to create this habitat and inform the community about how to support pollinators, we really need the help of partners within the community to build and maintain habitat in public spaces and help host educational events and share resources at these accessible public locations where we have habitat. And fortunately, Santa Fe is home to a really incredible urban conservation community who have been really instrumental in supporting this pollinator trail project. So with these really wide reaching partnerships, we can create habitat in existing open public spaces and provide support and outreach for each other's urban conservation initiatives. And this is just a sample of the different folks who've been really helpful in spreading the word about this project and uh, having their own habitat in Santa Fe. And finally, as part of building this pollinator trail, we are offering native pesticide-free plants through a habitat kit program. And our habitat kit program is a way for us to um, provide the resources necessary, the plants necessary, um, to residents and local organizations to plant pollinator gardens in uh, residential areas and on, in local public spaces. And we're hoping to use this mostly in urban Santa Fe to improve that pollinator connectivity where urbanization has removed a lot of resources for pollinators. And we'll be providing free plants to participants who commit to providing the time labor and space to establish them in yards and gardens throughout urban Santa Fe. So who are the kits for? They are for homeowners and renters in urban Santa Fe for our residential kits. And also they are available for use in public spaces such as parks, schoolyards, gardens, nature preserves, trailheads, churches, um, lots of different places can uh, host a habitat kit and plant a pollinator garden with these kits. Um, you do need to have ability to irrigate. Hand watering is okay. Irrigation is preferred. That's okay. Um, but these plants, though a lot of them are very xeric and will be able to withstand our very dry climate, they will need water in the first couple of years. So we do need water for the first couple of years they are established in the ground and you need enough space for the plants in full to partial sun to plant a kit. So about 300 square feet is needed for one kit. And that's about the size of a one car parking space, basically. And keep in mind that 300 square feet doesn't have to be just one spot. It can be the backyard and your side yard and your front yard. So it can be distributed across one property. And so if you're interested in our Habitat Kit program, um, you need to fill out an interest form by June 30th. We might extend the deadline, so just keep, keep that in mind. Um, and if you're selected, um, we'll ask you to sign a collaborative 
uh, project partner agreement, which just states you'll pick up the kit um, in September, mid-September and plant it uh, sooner than later. And then you'll submit follow-up information uh, the following year. So we wanna know, have these plants survived? Um, can you send us pictures and let us know of any pollinator observations you've made? So what is in the kit? That's probably what you're really wanting to know. Um, the kit contains um, climate smart species that are pesticide free pollinator plants um, that are all grown by Santa Ana Native Plant Nursery. And the different species in the kit provide blooms from spring to fall. So we have uh, spring to summer to fall blooming different plant species. And we have a total of 350 kits available. And one kit is a flat of 32 small transplants of perennial wildflowers, plus a small tree or shrub in a gallon pot. And the kits will also come with a pollinator habitat sign if you want one. And we'll have two kit types, the low water and the low to medium water kit. And here's what is in the low water kit. We have a uh, New Mexico olive is the bigger tree. Um, it will need a bit, it can get about 15 feet by 12 feet. So just keep that in mind. That's kind of um, the bigger space requirement. And then uh, for each of these different um, perennial wildflowers. So to give you a visual, here are the different um, species in the low water kit with the New Mexico olive on the left, providing the earliest spring blooms, moving to later in the summer with uh, coneflower and horsetail milkweed, and then the later species being desert mule's ear and threadleaf uh, ground cell. And then for our kit of low to medium water species, we have uh, three leaf sumac is the is the bigger shrub. So keep in mind that will that's the one that will need a little space, not as much as an olive, but um, it will still need some space. And then um, a lot of different uh, species here that mostly need very little water once they're established, but this kit has a couple species, the showy milkweed and the bee balm, need a little bit more water. So keep that in mind. Um, they won't need a whole lot more, like they're not really, really thirsty plants, but they will need to be in kind of maybe a wetter spot on your property or uh, maybe in the shade if, or partial shade if you can find it. And this is what they look like, the early spring blooming one being the sumac. Then we have pinstamen and showy milkweed, uh, prairie clover, golden aster, green thread, bee balm, and then later in the year, verbena and blanket flower blooming. And just keep in mind when you do get these kits, they will be small and without flowers and ready for pickup in mid-September. And uh, Anyone who is selected as a participant to receive kits, you will receive guidance on planting, watering, and maintenance of the kits. So just keep that in mind. They'll be small and need a little bit of TLC when you first get them this September. And if you're interested in participating, please visit our Habitat Kit website to read more about the program, fill out an interest form, and learn more. And just keep in mind the interest form due date is June 30th. So um, if you want to help build pollinator habitat in Santa Fe, this is one easy way you can do it. But if uh, you also just want to go see some bees in our different public spaces, please let me know. I'd love to hear about it. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Caitlin. We just have one question so far. And that um, you may have kind of covered this already because you did cover some of the bees, but what are the most common native bees in Santa Fe? Yeah, that's um, a really good question. So I, I did cover like some of the most, um, most common ones that you'll see, but there are so many others. I couldn't jam pack all of them in. So um, there is a really, um, diverse set of bees in the genus Diadasia, and those bees include specialists that um, feed on cactus pollen, 
they are also specialist. There's also species that specialize on globe mallow. So if you look at globe mallow kind of later in the summer, you'll probably see a Diadesia diminuta, which is a really small um, Diadesia bee species that feeds only on uh, pollen of globe mallow. They also have species that specialize on asters and sunflowers. So um, Diadesia is definitely one that I didn't include that's very, very common. Um, and there's also, if you go look at something like a coyote gourd right now, a coyote gourd flower, that squat, that native squash blossom. Um, if you look at it early in the morning, you might be able to see a squash bee. That's another specialist that only feeds on um, squash pollen. So that's um, one that's pretty common you can see here. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many other common ones, but I think I hit the, the really, really common ones. Right now, it's just um, tons and tons of leaf cutter bees most everywhere you look. And then um, there's obviously a lot of honeybees around town. If, you, if you're running into bees, you're, you're likely to run into a honeybee, um, but those, those native bees are, are really quite diverse and selecting just a few common ones is kind of hard. 